Welcome to this installment of Brave New World on Context TV. Today we're going to look at the future of Quibi. Quibi was uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Matt Whitman's uh, streaming product. Uh, the company raised a lot of uh, news uh, just by the sheer amount of money that they've raised. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had breakfast with Jeffrey Katzenberg and he took me through the project. And he basically, um, you know, he was talking about it being you know, on the spectrum between the improbable and the impossible. Um, what I thought was really interesting was his vision for uh, why there was a need for this. And of course, you know, it wasn't even called quick, uh, Quibi for quick bites at the time, but he was basically just describing how the same way that early on radio was just uh, articles being read um, and movies were just plays that were recorded. Um, he did raise the point that there hasn't necessarily been a revolution in production of video storytelling considering how much more we consume uh, content on mobile devices well uh, you know where sometimes there may not even be audio uh, if you're like uh, on the bus so to speak uh, and of course the fact that we're, we're consuming content in these short uh, quick bites of about five ten minutes um, clearly you know what Quibi is is it's a massive development fund that Jeffrey Katzenberg manages he's raised money from a lot of the strategics which may be a good or bad thing uh, but either way, it's it's launching soon, and the company is smart to take advantage of the COVID pandemic to things I would not, things I didn't think I would be saying in 2020. Um, but basically, the company will be giving away a three month subscription for free for fans and, and audiences to uh, consume the content. Uh, I think it's interesting um, because the success, obviously, of the product is not just going to be the content that it has secured, but uh, really the way it markets itself. I don't think most people outside of the you know trade publications really know what Quibi is. Uh, I don't think that they will care that Jeffrey Katzenberg is behind it. It will really boil down to the content, but even more so than the content, how it's marketed. Uh, I think obviously Times Square is not the same thing as it was, but proverbially speaking, it's one thing to get your big, you know, uh, high profile uh, marketing presences um, to make a splash, but ultimately it will boil down to customer acquisition. And then the retention will boil down to the content. What I feel is the, the smartest competitive advantage of Quibi is actually the fact that Jeffrey Katzenberg recognizes that storytellers today in Hollywood are entrepreneurs, and he's actually giving them the ability to retain IP and basically license that content that the storyteller retains the rights to, to Quibi for a window of I think two or three years after which they revert back to the uh, producer who could then take it elsewhere. I think long term that's probably why a lot of the entertainment class is going to stick around and want to support Quibi because ultimately that's the one thing that whenever I talk to uh, producers and uh, you know actors and directors and writers who are successful in Hollywood that's what they say about Watch Mojo, the fact that we own the content and we have a direct uh, link to our audience. So I think that long term will help them. Um, in terms of what the end game is for Quibi, look, I mean you know, you've, you've seen the math, right? Netflix has a $20 billion annual content development uh, and production budget. Um, how much can Quibi compete uh, remains to be seen. I think a kind of a long shot, but interesting little uh, possible end game is, believe it or not, for Apple to acquire um, Quibi. And I'll explain why. There is a little bit of a parallel. In 2014, Apple bought Beats, which was Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine's project for a uh, headphone uh, company for $3 billion. Uh, Apple is sitting on $200 billion of cash. You could argue that Apple may want to take a run at Netflix. I don't think they're going to do that. Um, you could argue Apple also didn't buy Spotify, which it should have bought many times over. Um, I think what the pandemic does is it changes the uh, dynamics quite a bit for um, all companies, especially Apple. Apple was probably more reliant on China as for supply chain than any other company. Uh, noteworthy that um, you know Tim Cook is the former COO, the CEO of the company. His claim to fame was supply chain and logistics. So I think he views it as something that he needs to remedy. I don't think most companies will want to find themselves in a situation where they rely so much on one country for their supply chain. So Apple will probably be spending a lot of energy building plants, not just in, in the Latin America and Mexico, but probably in the US as well. Um, as I like to say, sometimes when it comes to cost, low enough is good enough. I think this thirst for minimizing costs at all costs by putting your supply chain in Asia comes with this externality cost that uh, a lot of companies won't want to tolerate anymore. Um, but so in that lens, because they're going to be so much more focused on their core business, 
and changing the supply chain, I'm not so sure if they're going to have the appetite to be in the development game, which is a very different model than technology, where you have a patent, you have the software, you have the hardware, you then just replicate it, you fine tune it, and you just make money over time. In content, you know, it's a hits business. You, you might have had a hit, there's no guarantee you're going to have another hit. And I think because um, ultimately Apple itself looks at how much money Netflix and the other companies will be pouring into and Disney Plus will be pouring into their development and production. I could see them just saying, you know what, we are ultimately technology people. Uh, technology people historically have a not invented here, uh, you know, mental block before going out and buying other tech. But that has changed in the last decade where Google, Facebook, Snap, uh, Apple, these are companies that have largely grown through M&A instead of innovation in-house. And I think when it comes to content, and productions of these big, you know, high-risk projects. Uh, I'm not sure if Apple will want to stay in the game. However, because they have over a billion devices uh, through iPhones, iPads, and Macs installed, um, that's also not something that they want to necessarily get out of. So I'm not saying necessarily that they're going to go out and buy Quibi, but I think whenever you have a technically-minded uh, leader in Tim Cook um, and a culture that's very tech-oriented, and you realize you do need to differentiate somehow and stay in the content game, you then kind of look for this creative wizard and Jeffrey Katzenberg fits the bill quite well. And I think Jeffrey Katzenberg and Meg Whitman are also very realistic um, that they've raised a ton of money. Those investors will want an out. Um, and ultimately, I think Apple might make them a, um, an offer that might make sense because don't forget that most of the investors in Quibi are the studios who are looking at Netflix fearful as Netflix will also benefit during this pandemic. So, so the, the game of chess has kind of, you know, been, been shifted a little bit. The, the, the pieces have shifted a little bit uh, in 2020. And I give it a 25, 30% likelihood that Apple in the end just makes Quibi an offer and uh, sucks them in. What do you think?